Uh, my name is Abdurrahman Al Jarallah. Okay, today I'm going to talk about potassium, <laughs> calcium, and magnesium. In this talk, we're going to cover uh, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, hypermagnesemia, and hypomagnesemia. And we're going to uh, we're going to talk in the objective is uh, what is the causes, how to diagnose, and how to manage. So let's start to do the potassium. So hyperkalemia. Defined as a serum potassium concentration greater than 5 or 5.5. And uh, the range in the infant and children is age dependent. So the levels uh, higher than 7 can lead to significant hemodynamically and neurological consequences. So a level exceeding 8.5 can cause respiratory paralysis or cardiac arrest and can quickly be fatal. So let's start about the causes. So he, uh, here it uh, summarizes uh, the, uh, what is the most common causes that can cause hyperkalemia. So in, uh, in, our, uh, in, uh, in our approach, the, we see a patient that using uh, a lot of uh, ACE inhibitor methods. So be careful that when you see a patient who's using this type of medication and ca came with uh, hyperkalemia. And uh, so uh, acidosis and uh, either metabolic or uh, respiratory can cause. Uh, burns and traumatic injury, uh, hypoaldosteronism, uh, hemolysis, uh, excessive intake, uh, renal failure, or uh, uh, exertion uh, impairment. So, signs and symptoms. Usually, uh, uh, individuals with hyperkalemia are asymptomatic when uh, symptoms present are non specific and predominantly uh, related to mus uh, muscular or cardiac function either by uh, muscle paralysis, uh, dyspnea, palpitation, chest pain, nausea and vomiting, and pulses. So, uh, uh, in this slide, this is a, a summary of the signs and symptoms you can find in hyperkalemia. So, as we mentioned, uh, muscle cramps, urinary abnormality, respiratory distress, decreased cardiac contractility, ECG changes, and reflexes. So, the ECG uh, findings, uh, here, uh, the, the ECG findings uh, regarding uh, numbers of uh, potassium in the blood and uh, the ECG changes. So we can see if it's uh, uh, 3.6, there is a, it will be a, a, a rise in the T wave. If it's exceeded 6.8, it will be tinted T wave. And if it's exceeded 8.4, can uh, be tinted wave producing to a sinus wave. So the management, in the management, we have uh, three line of management, uh, heart protection management, uh, intracellular shift, and, uh, and uh, uh, exertion of, uh, of potassium in the blood. So we have uh, caxalate and forsamide uh, excretory by the, by the kidneys, and this is will redu uh, reduce the potassium. And, uh, and we have uh, insulin and glucose, as uh, Bader uh, mentioned, uh, can cause uh, intracellular shift, and uh, this is will, uh, uh, will correct the potassium. Uh, we have uh, sodium bicarb also, and we have uh, beta agonist albuterol uh, as an uh, inhaled intracellular uh, shift. Uh, as as a calcium gluconate, uh, uh, the studies that showed we started using calcium gluconate in, uh, when we have an ECG changes. Before of that, there is no uh, strong evidence that we uh, we, we use uh, calcium gluconate. So, and this uh, we finish uh, management of uh, hyperkalemia. Let's move on to hypokalemia. So, uh, hypokalemia is defined as a serum potassium less than three point five. So, moderate hypokalemia is a serum between 2.5 to 3, and if it's uh, less than, uh, this is called uh, severe, which is less than 2.5. So, hypokalemia is uh, potentially life-threatening uh, imbalance that may uh, be uh, iterogenic induced. So, the causes, the, there are so many causes of uh, hypokalemia. Medication, one of them, thiazide and loop diuretics. Uh, beta agonist, uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, antibiotics, and we have also uh, GI loses either by uh, vomiting or severe diarrhea or obstruction. We have intracellular shift, which is alkalosis or insulin. We have renal, which is uh, renal uh, tubular uh, acidosis, magnesium deficiency, and levodopa or gentamicin use. Endocrine, we have uh, DKA. So. 
And this, this is a summary of signs of symptoms of uh, hypokalemia, which is alkalosis, shallow respir uh, respiration, irritable confusion and drowness, weak, uh, weaknesses, and fatigue, arrhythmia, lethargy, and uh, throttle the pulse. Okay, this is the ACG changes uh, seen in hypokalemia, uh, which is, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's the level is 3.9, uh, we, we will uh, seeing uh, rising the U wave, uh, when the level is uh, more decrease, uh, the uh, the UF uh, to be it will be more pro uh, predominant and and we can see it uh, also associated with ST uh, ST depression. So in the in the management of hypokalemia, uh, in this we can see here if there is a signs uh, of uh, life threatening complication. If yes, uh, directly we 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 gonna we gonna uh, we're gonna correct. Uh, if it's no and the patient, uh, it depends on the patient, if he can tolerate orally and the patient has uh, uh, have functional bowel and uh, serum K more than 2.5, we will go to the oral supplementation. If no, uh, we will give him uh, uh, IV. So the IV is from 20 to 40 uh, mics per liter, IV, uh, potassium chloride, infused over uh, of 10 mics per hour. Higher concentration can be used uh, carefully for patients with a fluid overload. Uh, higher infusion uh, rate, uh, 20 mics per hour, require cardiac monitoring and visible central venous axis. No more than 60 uh, mics should be given before serum uh, potassium is rechecked. So uh, let's go to the complication. And the complication of hypokalemia it can uh, produce uh, rhabdomyolysis because of muscle ischemia. And there is one phenomena, uh, it's called uh, rebound hyperkalemia, which is a, re a real concern in patients with the distributive hyperkalemia, especially period, uh, period paralysis. The maximum dose of potassium replacement for this patient should be 90 mics in the 24 hour. And this patient, they, they usually came with a hypokalemia, then after correction, they entered the rebound uh, hyperkalemia. So with the patient giving a history or the, uh, or then the chart saying that the patient has a rebound hyperkalemia, we'll be uh, careful uh, of uh, uh, correcting the potassium. Now let's move on to the calcium. So calcium, we have uh, hypercalcemia, which is uh, uh, more than 10.5. Uh, we can classify it into a mild and life-threatening. 80% uh, of causes are due to malignancy or hyperparathyroidism. Okay, uh, so as we mentioned, it is most likely because of malignancy, uh, either uh, parathyroid hyperplasia, adenoma, multiple myeloma, uh, cancer, or can uh, it could be because of calcium supplementation, uh, or we can see it also in alcoholism. So uh, let's move on to the uh, clinical features. So severity uh, symptom is related not only to the absolute calcium level, but also the uh, rate of calcium rise. So hypercalcemic uh, crisis typically involve the pre-existing mild hypercalcemia, which develops into acute severe uh, hypercalcemic emergency. So I, uh, I, uh, I used to remember uh, uh, how, uh, the, the features of uh, hypercalcemia, which is uh, bones, stones, uh, groans, and psychotic overtones. And also there is an, uh, another, which is uh, banana, uh, bone pain, arrhythmic cardiac arrest, uh, kidney stones, muscle weaknesses, excessive urination. So let's move on to the diagnostic strategy, either by electrolytes, renal function test, and ECG. So, and also we have, we have to remember the, how to adjust uh, serum albumin. So the albumin will interfere with the calcium uh, concentration in the blood. So if it's less than or more than four, we need to adjust uh, calcium. So if it's less than four, we, we're gonna, uh, we have to add uh, 0 0.08 to get the exact number of calcium. If it's less, we're gonna uh, minus uh, 0 0.08 of the calcium to get the proper uh, calcium concentration. So let's move on to the ECG findings. So uh, the classical finding, which is a short QT, and we have ST segment elevation, 
Uh, we can also have sinus bridge, bundle branch uh, block, and high degree uh, arterioventicular block in severe cases of uh, hypercalcemia. So, and uh, in this ECG, we can see it's in, in the arrow over here, the shortened the QT uh, interval. In patient with uh, multiple myeloma and calcium level is 14.2. Uh, and let's, let's move on to the management. So the management is a uh, bolus of uh, normal uh, saline, uh, enter uh, a hemodynamically stable of the patient. So continue, uh, continue uh, IV normal saline at a rate of 200 to 300 ml per hour, goals of, uh, of two liter uh, urine output per day. The routine use of forsamide in, in the management of hypercalcemia is no longer recommended. So osteoclast uh, inhibiting uh, th therapies. This is we need to, before to start this one, we need to, to consult the primary physician or uh, uh, encourages uh, for the patient condition, which is the bisphosphonate, uh, calcitonin, or steroids for severe hypercalcemia. Uh, in rare cases, in which is a patient has a, a life-threatening hypercalcemic arrhythmia or heart block, uh, phosphate and uh, hemodialysis should be considered. In cases of hypercalcemia crisis resulting from primary hyperparathyroidism, urgent parathyroidectomy is uh, potentially curative. Okay, let's move on to uh, hypocalcemia, which is a uh, level uh, of um, calcium is less than 8.5. So the most common causes of hypocalcemia is the uh, hypoalbuminemia, hypoparathyroidism, uh, vitamin D deficiency, chronic renal failure, hyperphosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, and respiratory alkalosis, severe pancreatitis, and some of the drugs, bisphosphonate, uh, fluorentine, and phosphate, and calcitonin. And we have also tumor lysis syndrome in chemo patient and rhabdomyolysis. So what are the five most common uh, symptomatic causes of hypoglycemia uh, in, uh, seen in ED, which is the hyperventilation and anxiety, or using of uh, sympathetic drugs, uh, ethanol abuse or chronic mal malnutrition, which is a hypoalbuminemia, massive blood transfusion more than 10 units, toxin like uh, hydrofolic acid, uh, ethanol glycol, and severe pancreatitis. So the clinical features, um, uh, muscle cramping, uh, perioral or finger prosthesia, shortness of breath, secondary to bronchospasm, and tetanic uh, contraction. If severe may result in cardiovascular collapse, hypotension, dysarrhythmia, syncope, congestive heart failure, angina, and QT prolongation. So uh, I think if in this, this picture uh, for, the sign, uh, for the two signs of uh, phosphatic signs and uh, torso signs, uh, I looked up for this patient. This patient, he has just, uh, uh, they, they did for him a thyroidectomy and he presented to the ER after two days. And he came with these two symptoms, uh, which is a uh, carbobedial spasm uh, seen in uh, torso sign and uh, phosphatic signs, which is uh, facial uh, paralysis after uh, tabbing. And this patient, uh, they uh, uh, they correct they correct him uh, with uh, uh, as we uh, as we see this uh, by using a, a fluid. So the the administration of uh, calcium gluconate and was discharged home under oral supplementation and follow up with his uh, endocrine physician. So the diagnosis uh, strategies most clinical uh, suspicion uh, followed by appropriate laboratory testing. So the serum uh, uh, serum calcium level and isonide calcium level. And the ECG it shows a long QT. Uh, this is ACG uh, explaining hypo and hypercalcemia. Hypocalcemia, uh, which is uh, we see uh, uh, we seeing here uh, we seeing here prolonged the QTC, and uh, this is the normal. And in hypercalcemia, we, uh, we see it is short QT. Then let's move on to the uh, management. So, asymptomatic or mild symptoms, we can use uh, oral calcium uh, carbonate. If it's symptomatic, we, uh, we use calcium chloride through central line or calcium uh, gluconate through good peripheral line. 
Uh, patient taking the toxin have increased cardiac sensitivity to fluctuation and serum calcium. So the IV calcium administration should be uh, combined by continuous ECG monitoring. Most of patients requiring IV calcium should be admitted in the hospital for monitoring and treatment of the nausea, vomiting, hypertension, and bradycardia. Let's move on to the, uh, to the magnesium. So magnesium usually, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't focus on magnesium. And uh, in this slide, I hope to explain what is the importance of the magnesium and uh, sometimes it, uh, what, what is the reason behind the hyper or hypomagnesemia. So the, the primary clinical effect of the hypermagnesemia is, uh, is are from neuromuscular toxicity due to decrease impulse transmission across the uh, neuromuscular junction and cardiovascular toxicity due to calcium and potassium channel blocking effects. So if the hypermagnesemia, which is uh, the level more than 2.2, okay. So the most common causes of uh, hyperglycemia, uh, we, we see either by IV administration or oral, or either by impaired elimination or uh, impaired elimination because of medication. Other uh, common causes include DKA, adrenal insufficiency, uh, lithium therapy, rhabdomyolysis, tumor lysis syndrome, accidental ingestion of uh, opsum uh, salt, which is uh, nearly 100% of uh, magnesium salt. Let's move on to the clinical feature, early flushing, nausea and vomiting and lightheadedness. Then proceeded to generalized weakness and uh, slurred speech, dryness, lethargy, and can cause coma and respiratory failure. So, uh, in this schedule, this is uh, uh, describing signs and symptoms uh, according to the level. So if it's uh, from four to five, this is will uh, decrease uh, deep tender reflexes. If it's um, uh, five to seven, this is will cause hypotension. If it's 10, uh, respiratory insufficiency. If it's from 10 to 15, uh, it will lead to heart block. And uh, if it's 10 to 24, uh, may uh, lead to cardiac arrest. So examination, hyper, uh, hyperreflexia is uh, early finding and progresses to uh, salmonis and uh, reflexia. And finally, muscle uh, paralysis. Cardiovascular effect, either by hypertension, prolonged BR, and QT. And we have also ST and T wave inversion. And the bradycardia leading to AV block and asystole. So uh, uh, in this slide, this is a summary between hyper and hypo. So as we mentioned, flushing, decreased uh, DTR, muscle weaknesses, lethargy, decreased uh, respiration, and uh, bradycardia and hypotension. Uh, in next slide, I'm going to cover hypomagnesemia. So we will discuss the later on. So in the management, discontinue any exogenous uh, magnesium. Start with the normal saline IV plus diuretic to increase uh, renal exertion. And also we have uh, IV calcium, uh, uh, IV calcium which is uh, magnesium antagonist. And uh, start, uh, we, we give 100 to 200 milligram over five to 10 minutes if uh, life is threatening. Dialysis for severe cases or in setting of renal failure. So, hypomagnesemia is a common electrolyte uh, abnormality that often goes uh, undetected. Okay, so the range from 1.5 to 3. Symptoms typically benign to manifest, uh, begin to uh, manifest uh, if it's below than 1.2. Although symptoms are often not uh, well uh, correlated with the patient serum level. So the most common cause of fibromagnesemia, dietary, uh, GI, renal, endocrine, or metabolic, and drug-induced. So, and this we can, uh, uh, what, what can cause, uh, uh, what are the causes of uh, hypomagnesemia? It is uh, either can be caused because of GI lose, which is the pancreatitis, uh, small bowel obstruction, celiac disease, or it can cause because of uh, renal loss, either by, uh, loops diuretics, thiazide alcohol, or volume expansion, or uh, hypercalcemia, or either because of uh, nephrotoxic medication, uh, like uh, antifungal uh, and also uh, uh, also uh, sibiltine and uh, carbolitine. And also we can see here 
and this hypomagnesemia can can be co can cause uh, uh, can cause uh, vitamin D deficiency, leading to hypocalcemia, and also can be cause can cause uh, uh, hypokalemia, uh, and can cause also metabolic alkalosis. So. In the management, uh, uh, in special consideration, patient may, uh, maintained on uh, diuretics uh, using loop or thiazide diuretics are at a high risk uh, of hypomagnesemia. Uh, relatively receiving a specific medication like uh, ne nephrotoxic, as we mentioned, a long term use of PBI may be associated with interstitial uh, aspiration of uh, magnesium. Severe hypomagnesemia can uh, also be seen in patient. Uh, preparing for colonoscopy. So the magnesium uh, loses are further increased in chronic alco uh, alcoholic because of alcohol diuretics effects. Patient with hypokalemia, approximately 50% of patient with hypokalemia also have uh, magnesium deficiency. So hypokalemic patient who are refractory to potassium replacement are likely to, to be also uh, hypo, uh, uh, hypo, uh, hypo magnesium. Okay. <clears throat> so the features, as we mentioned here, and these features, uh, and this is slide. Sorry. So uh, we will have confusion, increased uh, DTR, neuromuscular irritation, seizure, muscle uh, cramps, and uh, uh, tremors, insomnia, and uh, tachycardia. So let's go back. So this is the, uh, as we mentioned, the clinical feature. Okay, so management. If a patient is stable with hypomagnesemia, can be treated with a loading dose one to two gram of magnesium sulfate during 10 to six, uh, 60 minutes, followed by maintenance dose of 0 0.5 to one uh, gram per hour until uh, symptoms have resolved. Patient in cardiac arrest should receive a bolus of from one to two magnesium, uh, gram of magnesium sulfate by IV push. Lower dose by at least 50% in patients with the chronic kidney disease. Check and correct for uh, associ uh, associated hypokalemia and hypocalcemia. So the complication, uh, magnesium sulfate administration can uh, result in flushing, hypotension, or dysarrhythmia. Monitor for sign of magnesium toxicity, which is a loss of deep tender reflexes. This is my resources, and thank you. Uh, regarding uh, regarding the hyperkalemia, Abrahman, um, you mentioned the ECG changes. Uh, ECG changes uh, just to know you know it's it's not necessarily to be as mentioned in the textbook. This is for theory, uh, but most of the like. Uh, observation and evidence uh, suggests that there is no clear correlation between the level of potassium and the ECG changes. So you might have uh, a wide QRS with a level that's much lower than uh, what is written in the textbook and versus um, and also you might have a normal ECG with a potassium of six or seven. So this is not the only uh, clue for hyperkalemia. And uh, uh, expect always that you might, and it's not correlated directly to the level of potassium. Um, for the management, uh, you summarize the uh, uh, hyperkalemia management. Uh, uh, we need to emphasize on some uh, points that uh, if at emergency, we need to focus on what's work uh, quickly and what is our target. So, K exhalate, you mentioned K exhalate. Um, uh, it works the onset four to six hours at least. Uh, recently, there is a lot of evidence and case studies series that it might cause uh, bowel ischemia perforation. Uh, so it's not not advisable to be used, uh, especially in acute setting, because you will not get the benefit of it early. Um, uh, and I think Abdurrahman, can you talk sodium bicarb for hyperkalemia? Yes. Hey, to my integral chain and sodium bicarb. Uh, hyperkalemia, yes. Mm. Uh, uh, mm. It's one line of the management. Mm. So, so a sodium bicarb can be used only if 
your uh, patient is acidotic. If your patient is not acidotic, it will not be out. So we correct, it can be used only if you have severe hyperkalemia with acidic patients. So you correct the acidosis in order to shift the potassium back, but it will not work in the secretion of um, uh, potassium. Uh, otherwise, always consider, uh, know the indication of dialysis, uh, when to ask for nephrology help, uh, because all, as we know, the 90, more than 90% of our potassium is secreted by kidney. So if you have a patient whose kidney is not working or on dialysis, whatever you give, whatever you do, he will, he will need or she will need to get rid of this potassium yeah. by dialysis.